I don't know what else to say, so I'll just continue. If you bear with me, I will remain with you as a relic of the past, and you can I'll remind you of the days when people said things like that. Uh, someone asked me to say something about Mother Sullivan. Well, I think that the thing that impressed me most about her is she's a very holy person. She's really holy. And it's another instance of that a kind of exploding the myth that you can't be holy and an intellectual at the same time because of all the real intellectual people I mean the really intellectual people that I've ever known or have generally been pretty solid people in other respects also I mean the, the mere fact of uh, when I say intellectual I mean somebody that's fully developed see, and she is a fully developed person and you can see that uh, her contact with the Bible and her scientific study of the Bible has uh, meant a tremendous amount in her life and that she's really got something. A very humble person too, a very charitable person. And of course I would have liked to have heard a great deal more from her about the Bible and so forth, but we didn't have too much time. But anyway, she may come back and and uh, But it's very, very good to have people like that come around and find to have contact with people like that. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, today, of course, I mean, the obvious topic, it would be Celtic monasticism, and I'm going to talk about that, because it's an extremely interesting and important topic. But before I get to that, I have another note. Somebody wants me to explain what is nirvana. See? Well, uh... I don't know. Does that mean that, uh, does anybody not have the faintest idea what it's well, well, what that is? What is nirvana? What uh, is anybody absolutely lost with this concept? Uh, you had never even heard of it before, or you're just not admitting it. <laughs> uh, what is nirvana? I mean, just you know, not not a, not a scientific answer, but brother, last, what do you think? What does it? What does that communicate to you? The Buddhists, yeah. I guess, I don't know if the Hindus are after it, after that too. I guess, but the Buddhists are. All right. That's, uh, in other words, it's the culminating, uh, the, the one idea that we all probably have of it is that it is what you aim at when you're a Buddhist, see, or even a Hindu. I'm not too sure whether, it is, but I mean, it's strictly, uh, definitely, it's the culmination of the Buddhist life. See, nirvana. And uh, it's equivalent to our concept of perfect union with God, and it's also equivalent to our concept of union with God in heaven. See, it is the final terminus of the uh, religious life and quest in Buddhism. However, uh, it does have special characteristics, and I suppose I should, I suppose that's really the point of the question. See, well, in what way is nirvana different, for example, from, uh, well, the, the culmination of the Christian religion and so forth? Well, one of the things about it is what it literally means is extinction. See, so therefore the, the idea is somewhat negative. Uh, it, it, pre it presents itself to us as negative, whereas our idea of the term of our fulfillment is usually presented in a pretty positive way, yes? When you say it's strictly a state, Well, they would say so, yes. See, I mean, they, it is defined by them purely as a, na it's a natural metaphysical. Uh, it's, it does not imply grace, see. Uh, but on the other hand, it does not imply just the fulfillment of your own effort either. You've got to be very careful with these, with these concepts because, you see, it's a totally different, uh, the, the whole setting is different. But it is natural, we'll put it that way, definitely. I mean, they, they do not conceive this in terms of grace, see. And they conceive it in terms of a metaphysical realization. And it is a, uh, what they say is, what they are saying, and this is tied up in a whole picture of who we are and how we, how the world is set up, see. And their idea is that basically we are all grounded in this absolute Void. See, now as soon as I start saying this, everybody's going to get all upset and what are they talking about and so on. It comes, if you study their metaphysics enough, it comes to be almost the same as pure being. Only they just state it negatively. See. Uh, 
And it's, uh, when you get into Buddhism, there's a very complicated way of talking about these things because they neither affirm nor negate and they kid around in all sorts of funny ways uh, to avoid getting into any kind of a bind, see, to avoid committing themselves to any kind of a statement that has an opposite. <laughs> But uh, so now nirvana is out of all that. It's the, the extinction of the individual self, of the individual phenomenal uh, limited contingent self, which is what stands in the way of the absolute. See, what's, uh, uh, we'll see in a minute. I'll get back to this in a second. But now when you really start talking about this, you've got to recognize that Buddhism is a very complicated phenomenon. And it's just as complicated as Christianity, and there are all kinds of different Christians. And uh, the fulfillment of the Christian life might mean one thing to us, and another thing to the Baptists down the road, and another thing to somebody in southern Italy, and so forth. It might basically be reducible to the same sort of thing, but it gets to be pretty different in practice. And for many Buddhists, uh, the, the idea of nirvana is very different. Although they may explain it in the same way, but they conceive it very differently. Now, for example, in popular Buddhism, what they say about, well, the way they would explain nirvana to you is this. See, this is the ordinary Buddhist running down the street or whatever he's doing. Uh, he believes in popular Buddhism, not the sophisticated, developed kind of Buddhism. He believes that there is reincarnation. See, and he believes that if you... Uh, don't make it to nirvana in this life. If you make it to nirvana, you're out of the whole, what they call the wheel of birth and death. You don't have to be born again. You don't have to come back and do it over. See? Uh, but if you don't uh, make a good job out of this life, then you've got to do it again. <laughs> See? And if you don't make a good job out of the next one, you've got to do it again. And you just got to keep on doing it until you get so fed up that you finally do a decent job. <laughs> See? And then you get into nirvana, which means to say that you don't have to be, you don't have to, you've got nothing more to do, you've finished your work. Now, this is not just, you can put this in a, in a way that it sounds rather screwy, but actually it is quite a deep concept, which is, has sort of a mythical character, because the more sophisticated Buddhists do not believe at all that you, uh, that your soul sort of flits from body to body. <laughs> Now, in Tibet, this is very important. They do believe that. In Tibet, they, they go to a whole lot of, of, of flim-flam to find out. For example, when the Dalai Lama dies, see, this was, there was a great deal of, of this in the press the last time the Dalai Lama died, which was about 20 years ago, I guess. They immediately go hunting all over the place to find a baby that was born about the same moment that he died. See, because they figure, well, maybe his soul flipped over to this, this kid. See. But they give him more tests than that. There are, there are very, very curious stories about uh, uh, how they try to prove that some kid is a reincarnation of, of some abbot of a monastery. See, what happens now, uh, if an abbot of a monastery dies, they don't just elect another abbot. They go hunting around to find some little kid that was born about the time he died, and then they sort of, they, they bring this little kid into the monastery, and they put him through various tests, and they'll give him, say, they'll, they'll put a half a dozen rosaries on the table. Take a rosary. A little kid, if he's, if he's the reincarnation of the abbot, he'll pick the abbot's rosary. See? And they'll say, uh, they'll, they'll put him through all sorts of little things like this. And they, they claim that it works out like that. I don't, I, I'm not making an affirmation of faith in it myself, but they say this. See? And they've got a whole system. But that's Tibet. But a very sophisticated Japanese Buddhist, for example, will not at all believe that this individual soul goes on to another individual body. And they don't hold that at all. See? Uh, and they say that what the whole thing really means is that uh, you have to really become a saint in this life, and if you don't, you've got to do it in the next life. And you've got to really fulfill your, your, your meaning, your reason for existence. And if you have to be born again, it's just a way of saying you haven't fulfilled your reason for existence. It's the same as us saying you have to go to purgatory. See, You haven't done a complete job, and you've got to finish it off somewhere else. Okay. Uh, Two big branches of Buddhism. There's one branch called the, the, the little vehicle, Hinayana, and another branch called the big vehicle, Mahayana. And the Hinayana Buddhism is in Ceylon and southern Burma and places like that. That's southern Buddhism. And this is all for individual development. Uh, 
The idea is they've got techniques of meditation and they, the idea is you get busy on your meditation, you become a monk and you meditate and pray and, and, and uh, deny yourself and lead an ascetic life and you make it to nirvana in one life and get it finished with, see. And all, that, all the man's concerned with is his own making it for himself. Now the Mahayana is completely different. They say that these Hinayana people are just selfish. What's the idea? What do you go just make it for yourself for? Just get out of the wheel of birth and death and leave everybody else suffering. And so the ideal of the Mahayana Buddhist is to become not uh, to go into nirvana, but to become what they call a bodhisattva, which is to say is a person who is eligible for nirvana, but refuses it in, uh, until everybody else is ready, see, in order to remain in the world and help save every living being. So that the ideal of Mahayana is an ideal of compassion. See, the ideal that, there, that, that, that he is going to, although he is ready for nirvana, and I've, uh, I haven't met, but Daniel Lu, the first time Daniel Lu was down here, he was telling me about somebody that he had met, some Asian that he had met, some Buddhist that he had met, who had uh, a monk who had arrived at the point where he was ready for nirvana, and then he said no. I'm going to stay in the, in, in the world and live among other people and try to help all these suffering beings. See? And uh, to identify himself with all these suffering beings until everybody is ready and then they all go into nirvana. See? Well, okay. Uh, in Zen, you'll get a, you'll, you're liable to get a statement like this. Somebody will ask a Zen master, what is nirvana? And the Zen master will, will answer, where are you standing? This is typical kind of a Zen approach. Or, look what's under your feet. Or something like that. Meaning what? Meaning you're in nirvana, but you don't know it. It's right here. It's now. See? This is it. Only you don't see, you can't see it. Why can't you see it? Because your selfhood is preventing you from seeing it. Because you are so involved in your ego existence that you cannot see, that you are delivered. And because you can't see it, you're not. Because you don't really want to be. You don't want to see it. See, You prefer, although you can't help it, that's not something uh, that you do consciously, but you prefer to think in terms of an ego existence, which prevents you from seeing that you are in nirvana. And so therefore you're not. See, But if you could... If you were capable, you would see it. See? But you're not capable, unless you suddenly, somehow or other, make the breakthrough. And when you make this breakthrough, then you do see. And this is very, you, you get very much the same thing in certain Christian saints. Uh, it's true to say, in a certain sense, that uh, we are, in a certain sense, in possession of eternal life now. In a certain sense, we are in heaven. Where we are, heaven is, because where we are, God is. Where God is, there's heaven, but we don't see it. See, we're not awake. We're not capable of seeing it, except that we do see it by faith. And St. Thomas, <coughs> pardon me for mentioning somebody so unpopular, said that the life of grace is, uh, so to speak, a beginning of eternal life. So that in the life of, of grace, when a person is living in the life of grace, he is already living in eternal life, and he's already in direct contact with God. Uh, but as our famous Father Odillo from Metkin once said in this place, he said, it's a face-to-face -face vision in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you see that, but in, in other words, in all religions, you tend to get uh, different viewpoints of these things in proportion as People are more spiritual, more sophisticated, and so forth. And in the, the, this Zen view that nirvana is right here, is pretty close, really, in practice, to the highest view in all the higher religions. It's the idea that it is not something extended away in time, so it isn't something horizontal, it's vertical. See, to live on this vertical dimension, and this is, this is really the uh, purpose of monasticism, and the, this is really the purpose of, of a deep spiritual life in any religion is to get into this vertical dimension, not to be constantly running towards something which is way out in front, but to realize that it is here and that we're not capable of grasping it, 
But that in one way or another, depending on what, what our religion teaches us, with us, of course, the answer is faith and God's grace and love and openness to God's will. I mean, the sense, see, with us, it's not, with Zen, it's a metaphysical thing. See, the, 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 with Zen, it's the idea that, that things are, are such that if you could see it, you would see all the way right down into the ground of everything and you would see uh, into the heart of things and see that you are there. With us, it's a question of faith and grace rather than metaphysics. Do we believe that God is present within us and we believe that he loves us and we believe that he is giving us his grace and he's calling to us and that we can respond, see? So that is our life. But whichever way you look at it, this is what makes life worth living. And this is the thing that we are constantly coming back to, is that God is with us and that we can be in contact with him, in personal, direct contact with him, by faith and by love and by obedience and by grace and by all the things, by prayer and so forth. And this is the heart of our life. I mean, there is this awareness, this conviction of the reality of our life and the reality of the things that we are doing, that they do keep us. And it's not just simply a, 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 uh, an idea, because we know that when we do correspond to God's grace, then he makes known his love to us. Okay, let's talk about Celtic monasticism. Is that okay? Celtic monasticism is really, really, really something very beautiful. It's wonderful. Wonderful topic. I'm not going to get into the whole thing because I want to finish up Sufism, but I might as well, if I can dig into some old notes I've got, I've got some old notes on it, I might dig up some Irish rules and things like that. I mean, it might come in handy for <laughs> for, for, for renewal. We might, uh, uh, but I don't, I'm not recommending that anybody keep the rule of St. Columban. Uh, if you want a, want a real mean rule, why just take that one? Because they were, they were all the time getting beaten for everything. You did, you, you, I mean, they had the, they overworked the whip. So if that's the kind of monasticism you want, well, just uh, just don't just count me out. I, that's not my kind. But there are all kinds of Irish monasticism too. See, all, the, the Irish monasticism was something quite unique in a lot of ways. Uh, and Ireland. Of all all the countries in Christendom, Ireland is, is is one with a really with a culture that you have to call a monastic culture. The golden there was a golden age of Irish culture of Celtic culture when Ireland was the civilized country in the Western world. This is no exaggeration. I am not Irish. I haven't got a drop of Irish blood. I'm Welsh, <laughs> See? but the Welsh are all in part of the same same uh, same. We're not quite the same kettle of fish. I mean, the, the Irish are a little more, uh, a little less crazy than the Welsh. I mean, the Welsh are, are, are the most far, far out Celts that there are, but, but they're, they're very mysterious, strange people. The Irish are just Irish. But there was a time when the Irish were the civilized people of Europe, the most civilized people and the civilizing force on the rest of Europe. And this was not because they were Irish. But as it was because of, there was a very good historical reason for it. What was that? And when was this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, why did? Why was this true? Well, they pretty civilized the Western Europe their navigation. Yeah, but I mean, why did they? I mean, after all, if the Roman Empire had, uh, was there any? Why wasn't there so much competition in the sixth and seventh century? Yeah, the barbarians. See, the, bar the, the, Ir the Irish escaped the barbarian invasions. So the barbarian invasions destroyed the Roman Empire, destroyed Roman civilization, and there was just, you know, there were relics and remains of it around, but Irish Ireland was untouched. But Ireland got it later. See, because you had this, this the success of Ireland got it from the Vikings in the 10th century. And, of course, this was, this was another big wave. This history is very interesting. It's one of the most interesting periods of history is the 6th to the 10th century. It's really because things were really tough then. And these invasions, these constant waves, one after the other, it's, it's fantastic, the different, because all modern Europe was produced by these invasions, see. Uh, all you got, all, all the non-Celts around. See, the Celts were the original people. The Celts and the Basques, and Celts in the center of France, and the Basques, and people like that in, in, in certain parts of Spain, were the, were the original people. And then 
all these barbarians came in, see, and uh, either pushed the Celts over into Wales or Ireland or pushed them down into Spain. Then you got the Goths and the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the and the, then the Danes and the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings and all those people, the Normans and so forth, and the Franks and the all these people, see, came in and, and created the modern countries. France and Spain and so forth and so forth were all uh, the product of, of these invasions. And uh, But the Irish in the 6th and 7th century were the cultivated, real civilized people in Europe, and they had a monastic culture. Now, this is not due to the saint of the day. See, St. Patrick, with all due respect to St. Patrick, I bow to St. Patrick, and I honor St. Patrick, but he was not a monk. Although he is said to be, some people hold that he went to the monastery of Laurent. Incidentally, you know the horrible truth about St. Patrick. The dreadful truth about St. Patrick was that he was an Englishman. <laughs> only you can't say you, only you can't say that he was an Englishman because the Angles hadn't come, and he was a Briton. See, so therefore he was a Celt from 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 England. See, he was a, one of the Celts in England that were there before the Anglo-Saxons came in. So he was like an Irishman. He was a, just a, just a Celt from England, but he, well, you could say that he was a, a Brit. But of course, you have to say that and then duck. <laughs> it's not exactly a popular statement. But anyway, he was taken. You know how he got to Ireland. He was a, a boy in England, and some Irish came over there on a slave raid and captured a bunch of people, including Patrick. See, and they dragged Patrick off to Ireland as a slave. And then Patrick, as a slave in Ireland, he escaped after a while. But he liked Ireland. And he said, gee, that was a nice country. I'm going to go back there. And he had gone to Rome, meanwhile. And then he went to the monastery of Lera, as some people think, and came back to Ireland as to preach Christianity. But he wasn't absolutely the only one. See, there are, there's a lot of scholarship on this thing. That there were other missionaries also engaged with this in the same time as, as Patrick. And he did not bring monasticism to Ireland. Monasticism came to Ireland from Wales or Scotland, one or the other. Uh, one of the places where monasticism, one of the monastic centers in Wales where it is supposed to have come to Ireland from is the island where we have a monastery today, Caldy. Caldy is one of the oldest monasteries in Europe. Uh, we now, one of our, it's a monastery of our order at the moment. But that was a place where uh, there was a monastic center, and it may have been the one where the first monks went to Ireland from, or it may have been up in Scotland near Glasgow. There was another center called uh, St. Ninian, is a very important saint in this connection, though you've never heard of probably, but, but still he, uh, he's up, he was up in there in the lowlands of Scotland, and he may have sent a colony to Ireland. And there were other colonies in Wales that might have gone over to Ireland. And of course, these where did these colonies in, in, in Wales and, and England come from? Well, they were way back in Roman times, you see. They, they existed in the, in the Roman, in Christian Roman Empire. And they had probably come, these were men who had probably been in the East. See. Irish monasticism, one of the things that's so interesting about it is that you know, there was a great deal of direct contact with Syria and Egypt. In other words, Irish monasticism did not uh, get filtered through Italy, then France, and then England, and then Ireland. See, it may have to, the, the first jump may have come from Wales to Ireland, but after they got monasticism, the Irish went straight to the source. See, and uh, the, these, these fellows were great travelers. The Irish would hop in a boat and say, oh, okay, so this, this stuff comes from Syria. Well, let's go see what these guys are doing in Syria. And they'd get in a boat and head for Syria. See. And pretty soon, the next thing you know, there they were in Syria. Then they would come back to Ireland and bring all the stuff direct from Syria to Ireland. There's a great deal of evidence that there was direct contact between Ireland and Syria and Egypt, and that they brought this. The, the uh, one of the sources, of course, there's a lot of argument about all these things, but one of the places where it seems to be most evident is in Irish illuminated manuscripts. It is said that a lot of these illuminated manuscripts are direct borrowings from Syria, but then there are a lot of other people say that they weren't. But anyway, it is possible that they did. And they certainly had a great deal of, they had some direct contact. And then they did all sorts of very original things. Uh, one, of course, one of the interesting things, when I say Ireland was a monastic culture, an Irish monastery wasn't anything like this. See, an Irish monastery in the golden age of Ireland, uh, supposing this were 
an Irish monastic center, say, in the 5th century or the 6th century. Well, okay, first of all, everybody in the clan, see, is somehow or other connected with the monastery, men, women, and children, everybody. The abbot of the monastery is also the head of the clan. And all the countryside is involved in the monastic community. Uh, and you have a certain nucleus of uh, people who are ascetics and so forth, but then the local villages are all under the abbot. Uh, and they're all members of the abbot's clan. And he runs the thing because he, uh, since he's the head of the clan, they, they make him the head of the community, and then he also runs everything. And there's a bishop around, but the bishop is a very minor person. The bishop is some fellow, some monk that the abbot has decided, well, we need a bishop, but you've got to have a bishop for confirmation and things like that. So he will get one of the monks ordained bishop, but he remains, he's just, you know, halfway down the line somewhere. See, he's a sort of a sub-prior. Isn't even that, that's right. He doesn't even have to have any kind of, 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 of uh, office in the community. He's just the local bishop, see. And he's around, and he's washing the dishes or something like that. And the abbot says, oh, hey, we've got to have an ordinary, I'm going to ordain a couple of deacons. Go get that bishop, will you? You get him out of there. Where is that guy? You never know where he is. <laughs> and then they bring the bishop in, and he, they ordain a couple of deacons and so forth. Now, of course, this wasn't Patrick's idea. See, Patrick was, was, was running an, another kind of system that was more, <laughs> that, that went more with Rome, see. Because Patrick was a man who was in direct contact with Rome. And he was, in a certain sense, the Roman, the, the, the sort of official man that Rome wanted in Ireland. And Patrick was more for the regular diocese and keeping these abbots in their place and so forth. But it didn't always work out that way because Ireland was a long way away and there weren't, you know, the communications weren't so rapid and there were you no know, roads and that sort of thing. And if somebody out in Galway had a, was an abbot and had his, I mean, he didn't, he hadn't heard of any of this other stuff. But then, uh, there are, there remain today. For example, there's a place off the west coast of Ireland, down there, right down, what's that last county down at the bottom? I don't know. So down near St. Brendan's Point, down there somewhere. There's this, there's a rock off the shore, about two or three miles offshore. Uh, the, the rock of St. Michael. Sheer rock coming right up out of the sea. Right in, over in the western, it's right in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's foggy most of the time, and the, the rain comes blowing in there from straight from Africa. Because it's just, you know, it's wide open all the way south. And out on this rock, there are still today monastic cells built by these Irish hermits in the 5th century. And these cells are perfect constructions made out of just loose stones that they picked up. They, they're, they're in the shape of a beehive. They're like an igloo. Uh, the, and they the round. And they made these round cells, just as loose stones that they fitted together without mortar. There's not a bit of cement in the whole thing. And they fitted the thing together circularly, and they're holding together perfectly today, and you can go in them, and you know there's never a drop of rain comes through. And they're absolutely dry. <laughs> and these fellows were living out on these rocks uh, in the 5th century. This was a monastic a, a colony. Now, on these islands, of course, they loved islands. They loved to get off on a rock in the sea. And one of the standard things of, of Irish monasticism, uh, and b my idea is that the Irish hermits had it better than anybody ever did. I mean, they were, they were the real, they were the real McCoy because there was no nonsense about them. See, they really loved to be out on a rock someplace or loved to be out in the woods someplace. They wrote all kinds of poetry about, about the birds and that kind of stuff. There was no nonsense about uh, not being in contact with nature. They were very much in contact with everything. They loved creation. They, they were very Franciscan and a great deal of praise of God and, and so forth. And one of the things that you did in an Irish monastery, if you were Cenobites, come summer, if you wanted, you could get permission to hop, a, hop in a boat and head for some rock out there. You know, to, uh, suppose you're up in the north of Ireland, well, you know that over there is Scotland, and you know there are hundreds of islands off the coast of Scotland, so you go to the abbot and say, can I take the summer off? I want to go up to one of those islands out there. I want to find an island that nobody else is on, and I want to spend the summer out there with the seabirds. So live on an island with thousands of seagulls. So they do that. They get permission. They head for one of these islands. And then a man would just sit on a rock in the middle of the sea all by himself for the summer. 
meditate, pray, and so when it starts getting real nasty, I mean, the fall comes along, the weather gets better, and he heads back to the monastery. And he's in the monastery for the winter. And then he studies and, you know, does his, reads all, all the new books that have just been transcribed and that sort of thing. And then the next summer he goes back off on this rock without any books and then sort of a sack of bread and he eats, he fishes and eats fish and eats uh, seagulls' eggs and things like that. This was a standard thing. And so one of the things that they did too, of course, the ideal of, an, of Irish Christendom was martyrdom, but uh, since you, you weren't that likely to be martyred so easy, they had various kinds of martyrdom. And they had three colors of martyrdom. There's red martyrdom, and there's white martyrdom, and there's green martyrdom. Red martyrdom is straight martyrdom, where you go, uh, I mean, you would go someplace where there were people who didn't like Christians and then get yourself killed. But it was, where, where that usually was in the 6th century was Germany. See? You would ha if you wanted red martyrdom, you would make a beeline for Germany and get down in Bavaria someplace where they were still killing Christians, see, and get yourself, get your head chopped off or something. But as Bavaria became very quickly Christian, then what you would do would uh, go on a pilgrimage because pilgrimage was equivalent to martyrdom. Uh, and this was white martyrdom. That was pilgrimage. Or a, a monastic life was equivalent to martyrdom. But it had to be something, uh, you had to sort of really stick your neck out. You had to do something rather drastic. See? And what they very often did, they would get that boat and take off without oars. <laughs> See, just, just let the Lord take care of it. They sit out of the boat, push them off, or sort of sit there and wait, see what happens. Well... Uh, very often they just are washed back to another part of Ireland. <laughs> then they get pushed off again and take another. But, but they very, very often they would end up in France, see, end up in Brittany, and a lot of monasticism in Brittany in northern France. Incidentally, there's a there's a nice little colony of hermits that's started by the Abbey of Bouquen now, in an island in the Channel, which is standard for Celtic monks for two thousand years. And now this is a Cistercian monastery, which has hermits, uh, and the reason the hermits are on this island is that they can't stand all the reforms that are going on in the monastery, so they're out of the, they don't like to do stuff in the monastery, so they're out living on, on this little island where it's peaceful. But the Irish would get this sort of take off like that, and it is believed. Well, it's not only believed, it's known. Some of them got to Iceland. They were the first people in Iceland were Irish monks, unless maybe Eskimos, I don't know. But the first traces of any kind of civilization in Ireland, I mean in Iceland, were Irish monks. When the Vikings got to Iceland, they found Irish monks there. And this is recorded in Viking historical documents. Here were these monks up on Iceland. They, they didn't get back after that summer. It was a bit too far. See. And it is quite possible that they got to Greenland, and it's quite possible that they got to America. There's, there's nothing has, has yet been uh, found to prove it, but nothing's been found to disprove it either. And I, uh, I personally will be the last man to be surprised if someday they find some traces of something up way the heck up by Duluth or something like that. These cookies found, probably found the St. Lawrence River and went right the way up to the end of the Great Lakes. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, it's quite possible. And there is even a... <laughs> There is even a, a, of course, they could have run into some very interesting things in this country here. Because there were some fantastic things going on in this country way back then. There were some fantastic Indian civilizations that disappeared before the rest of the white people got here. These, these fellows that were making these mounds up around here in Ohio. You see, they disappeared by the time the, the, the white people, the Americans, came out here. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't around anymore, but they've left these mounds. Very strange mound. There's, there's one mound up back of Cincinnati somewhere. So it's a long thing. Seen from the air, it looks like a snake uh, going across the country. And nobody's ever figured out who did these things. Well, then they know that they've, they've got it. They know who did it more or less, but I mean, they have no real details about them. Uh, so they, 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 all sorts of funny things could have happened. Another thing that they would do a standard procedure for an Irish monk was to say, well, I'm taking off to look for the place of my resurrection. And the abbot would say, okay, son, go in peace. And he would head for 
wherever he's ever. Maybe he would head for Jerusalem. See, maybe he'd say, I, I, the, the standard thing, if you're a Christian in those days, well, I'd like to go to Jerusalem and then settle down. And you, you find the place of your resurrection of a little, you get the word, so to speak, when you get there. And when you find the place of your resurrection, then you settle down as a recluse. Uh, if it's a Christian country, you settle down, you get yourself walled into a little hut on the side of a church. See? And this is your tomb, and you're, you're, you're dead. See, you say, well, this is it. This is the place of my resurrection. Why move any further? Agitorium Rostrum, along with his own.